In this video, we will discuss 10 interesting facts on ancient Roman soldiers. Stick around. Facts about the ancient Roman army. Rome's all-conquering military machine holds a special place in our minds. Its efficiency and discipline made a small city on the Italian peninsula rule over most of the Western world, from the British Isles to the Near East and from the Rhine to North Africa. Here are some interesting facts about the Roman army, some of which can explain part of its success and also its failures. Number 10. Seasonality in War During the Romans' early history, the logistical challenges of conducting a war meant that Romans only fought between sowing and harvest during the summer. Rome was an agricultural-based economy and the movement of troops during winter was highly demanding. According to Livy, History of Rome 5.6, if a war was not over by the end of summer, our soldiers must wait through the winter. He also mentioned a curious way that many soldiers choose to spend the time during the long waiting. The pleasure of hunting carries men off through snow and frost to the mountains and the woods. The first recorded continuation of war into the winter by the Romans took place in 396 BC during the siege of the Etruscan city. Number 9. Decimation Mutiny of the troops was always a potential issue for Roman generals, and there were many policies in place to discourage this type of behavior. Punishment by decimation was arguably the most feared and effective. It involved the beating or stoning to death of every tenth man within the army unit where mutiny took place. The victims were chosen by a lot of their own colleagues. Whenever a group within the army was planning a mutiny, prospect of decimation made them think twice, and they were likely to be reported by their own colleagues. The Romans knew that decimation, although effective, was also unjust because of the actual victims might not have had anything to do with the mutiny. From the standpoint of the Romans, the unfairness of decimation was a necessary evil. Tacitus wrote, setting an example on a large scale always involves a degree of injustice when individuals suffer to ensure the public good. Number eight, property qualification. Military service was born a duty and privilege of Roman citizens. In its early days, the Roman army was composed exclusively of citizens and organized on the basis of their social status, according to the weapons and equipment they could afford. The richest served in the cavalry, those not so rich served in the infantry, and men without property were excluded from the army. After the Second Punic War, this recruitment system became obsolete. Rome had become involved in longer and larger wars, and they needed a permanent military presence in their newly conquered territories. The property qualification was therefore reduced. During the second century BC, Property qualification was reduced even more, and in 107 BC, Gaius Marius began to accept volunteers who had no property and were equipped at the expense of the government. Number 7. Siege Warfare Whenever a town or building was under siege, a special army unit was sent ahead to surround the settlement and prevent anyone from escaping. A fortified camp would then be established around the area preferably on high ground and always out of missile range. An army unit would then be sent to breach the defensive walls, protected by covering fire from archers, bolt firers, and catapults. The catapult was one of the most intimidating siege weapons. Josephus offers us a first-hand account of the catapult's devastating power. A soldier standing on the wall near Josephus was struck by it. His head was torn off by the stone missile and the upper part of his skull was hurled 550 meters. Number six, tunneling. Tunneling was key for siege warfare. 
the failure or success of many sieges was decided on how well the Romans were able to breach the defensive walls by digging tunnels underneath the town or building in question and breaking in. Although this was an effective tactic, it became widely known to Rome's enemies and eventually lost its surprise factor. During one war in the early 1st century BC, the Romans were trying to dig a tunnel to breach the defenses of the city. Its inhabitants drove a number of dangerous wild animals into the tunnel, including bears and even bees. The oldest archaeological evidence of chemical warfare has been dated to the 3rd century AD and comes from tunnels found at Dura Europus, Syria, where evidence of an underground battle between the Romans and the Persians were found. Persians were besieging a Roman garrison and using tunnels to break in. The Romans responded by also digging tunnels to neutralize the attackers. Skeletons and weapons in one of these galleries attest to the fact that the Roman soldiers were choked to death by asphyxiation gas cloud coming from butemen and sulfur crystals ignited by the Persians. Number five, helmet function. According to some ancient writers, Helmets in the Roman army had other benefits besides the obvious protective function. Polybius noted that the decorations on top of their helmets had a psychological impact on their enemies because it made the Roman soldiers look taller and more intimidating. The use of helmet decoration to intimidate enemies was widely practiced by most cultures. But in this case, Polybius was referring specifically to the use of a circle of feathers to make the Romans look considerably taller than what they actually were. This observation makes sense when we consider that many of their enemies, especially in Central Europe, Gauls and Germans, were much taller and robust than the Romans. Number four, decision-making process. During the times of the Roman Republic, only the Senate considered the governmental entity that embodied the will of Roman citizens, was entitled to declare war. As Rome expanded and the power of its generals grew larger, some wars were declared by the Roman generals without senatorial approval. An example of this was the war against Methodius of Pontus, which was declared in 89 BC by the consul and general Manius Achilius, without any involvement from the Senate. This was illegal in theory, but in practice, there was little the Senate could do. Some generals were just too powerful. When Rome became an empire, the decision of going to war became the emperor's responsibility alone. Number three, the Fatials. Rome had a specialized body of priests known as the Fatials, whose sole obligation was to perform the rituals involved in going to war and making treaties. The final step in the ritual of declaring war was throwing a spear into the territory of the enemy. By the early third century BC, Rome had expanded significantly covering almost all the Italian peninsula from the Po Valley to the south. Throwing a spear into enemy territory was no longer a convenient procedure for declaring war. The borders of Rome were too far away for the Fatials to complete the ritual. Superstitions, however, don't die easily, and the priests came up with a clever alternative. A portion of land not far from the Temple of Bologna, the goddess of war, was declared to be non-Roman. At the time of the war against King Pyrrhus, an enemy soldier was captured by the Romans and forced to buy part of this land so that the spear could be thrown into it. Number two, the gladius. The standard short sword used by the Roman army was known as the gladius, the Spanish sword, and it was developed in the Iberian Peninsula. Its lethal effectiveness and practicality were proverbial. According to Livy, History of Rome, when the Romans fought against Philip V during the Macedonian War, the Macedonians were shocked by the effects of the Roman sword. The Macedonians had so far only seen wounds inflicted by spears and arrows. When they saw the bodies dismembered by the Roman Spanish swords, and arms sliced off at the shoulder, and heads separated from the trunk, neck and all, and entrails exposed, they trembled as they realized what weapons and what soldiers they would have to face. Number one, donatives. The Praetorian Guard was a specialized unit of the Roman army that acted as household troops to the emperor and his personal bodyguards. During the first century BC, the Praetorian Guard occasionally got involved in the process of appointing new emperors. 
But as time went by, their involvement grew larger until they eventually got into a position where they were able to appoint, remove, and even murder Roman emperors. One incentive for murdering the emperors and appointing the new ones was a practice known as the donative, which was an economic reward that the Praetorian Guard received from the newly appointed emperor once the previous one was killed. This has been 10 interesting facts about the Roman army. If you have any additional facts, please comment down below. And please, if you like the video, please consider sharing it. Hit the thumbs up. Hit the bell notification. That way you are notified every time a new video comes out. And I'll see you next time. This.